Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, we're just going to give it a, a, a minute or so whilst everyone else joins us. Um, we do, as I'm sure would come as no surprise, have quite a high number of people um, who have registered for this evening's event. Um, just as always, uh, thank you for joining us, the Zionist Federation and the World Zionist Federation um, for this event this evening. Just a, a couple of house rules. We have set it um, so that all of your video is off and your microphones are all muted. Um, that's simply, as, as, as you all know, to, to allow for um, as, as few distractions as possible whilst our, our very esteemed speaker um, addresses us. Um, so so that's, that's the house rules. Um, he will be presenting for about 50 minutes or so, slightly more potentially. Um, but it's, I'm sure this, you know, that, that you will find this evening very interesting and very engaging. Um, so good evening to you all. Thank you for, for, for coming and joining us. Um, we are, we consider ourselves very lucky, very fortunate to be hosting Emmanuel Miller of Honest Reporting, an organization that we are sure you are all very well aware of. Um, and he's joining us for an update on how the British media covered uh, and reported on events in Israel over April and May earlier this year, leading up to and during the Operation Guardian of the Walls. Emmanuel is a senior analyst with Honest Reporting and has previously worked for some of Israel's leading in English language uh, outlets, news outlets. Having grown up in London before serving in the IDF, um, Emmanuel is uniquely able to analyze and brief on how the British media approaches the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, Emmanuel will also be sharing exclusive research which we, the ZF, commissioned Honest Reporting to undertake on this issue. We are very, very excited uh, to publicly reveal this work for the first time tonight. So I think without further ado, um, just one final request again, for everyone to please um, keep their mics on mute to keep their video off and without further ado I shall hand the floor over to you Emmanuel the floor is yours thank you very much and thank you for everybody for joining today and a special thank you to Steve and to the Zionist Federation for having me uh, this is actually some of, of a homecoming for me because before I made official Aliyah I spent a few months working for the Zionist Federation myself I don't know if you're aware of this Steve but when I made Aliyah in 2009, I was lucky enough to be part of the ZF for a few months. So first of all, just to introduce who I am and honest, who Honest Reporting are. Um, so I am, as you can tell, born and bred in London. I made Aliyah many years ago. I've served in the IDF. I have worked for the Jerusalem Post and the Times of Israel. And I also helped establish the English language department of an NGO called My Truth, which documents and shares the experiences of Israeli soldiers um, in confronting an immoral and cynical enemy in Hamas. And I have, for the last almost three years now, I've been working for Honest Reporting, which is a media watchdog based in Jerusalem, which counters anti-Israel bias. And um, for those of you who don't know, I'll just see if I can share my screen. Um, really Honest Reporting started, hang on, I'll see how to do this. Share this and please tell me. That's it. Yep. Um, this is the photo that started it all. This is a picture in 2000 that was taken by the Associated Press, published in the New York Times, and it caused outrage um, because, as you can see, it says it's an Israeli policeman and a P Palestinian on the Temple Mount. But if you look in the background behind the uh, Israeli policeman, you can see it says in Hebrew, liter solar. It says it's, it's a gas station, it's a, it's a petrol station. There are no petrol stations on the Temple Mount. The Palestinian, um, as, it's, um, as it's described in the paper, is not actually a, a Palestinian at all. It's Tuvia Grossman, an American Jew visiting Israel. He was lynched um, almost successfully. He was almost killed by a Palestinian mob who pulled him out of a taxi. And the Israeli policeman wasn't attacking him. 
it was holding up his truncheon, but it was to defend this Jewish bystander who was almost killed. And the outrage was immense. People were disgusted that such a thing could happen. The father of Tuvia wrote to the New York Times saying, this is my son here. And after the New York Times published a half-hearted apology, a retraction, and even then not saying that he was attacked by a, um, a Palestinian mob, a group of British students sent this out in an email list that they had compiled and urged their friends and colleagues to get in touch with the New York Times and demand a full retraction and apology. And that was the beginning of honest reporting. They got the retraction, they got the apology. Um, the picture was reprinted in the paper together with a proper description. And since then, the organization has grown and grown and we've got a number of successes. And towards the end of the presentation, you hear about, you'll hear about our latest big success. But for now, we shall focus on, how do I do this? Get myself out of. Excuse me, whilst I peer over the screen, I'm still figuring this technology out. No, I'm not managing. Ah, oh. stop share. Okay, there we go. Um, so I want to think, focus on what's happening today. So before I actually move on to the coverage um, of the war, I just want to talk about something that is Really, it's really about how we talk about journalism. As someone who worked for the Times of Israel and the Jerusalem Post, I avoid the term the mainstream media. It has negative connotations and it's actually a favor of extremists. And I believe it's helpful to make an admittedly imperfect comparison to Jews. We don't like it when people say that the Jews do X or do or believe in Y. Jews are a large group and we have many beliefs and we do many different things. So when one Jew does something wrong, it's certainly not fair to hold all Jews responsible. And I think we can make a comparison here to journalists. If a particular journalist gets something wrong, it's right to hold that journalist to account. And depending on the severity of the wrongdoing to hold his editors or her editors to account, better that than blame the entire mainstream media. Um, doing that comes across as heavy handed and fuels hatred of the media, something that I want no part in. And after all, it is the role of the media to keep our politicians and leaders honest. And it is our job as a media watchdog to keep the media honest. So for years, honest reporting, reporting has taken this approach. We document instances of flawed reporting, we analyze them and we push for retractions. However, such an approach can only take us so far. Whilst there isn't a media conspiracy against Israel or the Jews, there certainly are phenomena which extend beyond individuals. For example, PAC journalism um, impacts the story being told, and that's something former Associated Press journalist Matty Friedman explained in great detail in a 2014 essay published by The Atlantic. And I'll just see if I can show you that. Um, share screen. Show all windows. A moment. I can show you this at the very least. Hope you're able to see. Still having some technical issues working out this technology. Are you okay though with the share screen facility? I think I have got it. Okay, so just press F5 here. And no, it's gone to the wrong slide. Okay, so you can see this now, the, what the media gets wrong about Israel. Um, written in 2014, it's a brilliant, brilliant piece. Um, I've quoted a bit on the side here. Um, you can read that for yourselves. In the meantime, I can tell you about what Matty Freeman was an Associated Press journalist. And in the article, 
he wrote about how he would send stories and they weren't published they, they didn't fit the narrative and he also explained something very interesting that journalists in Jerusalem tend to hang out together they tend to, to hang out together also with the international crowd including members of NGOs and so they and also members of the UN so their opinions coalesce to some extent and it's actually very interesting the building the honest reporting is based in this is a little tidbit for you but the building the honest reporting is based in Jerusalem is also a building in which numerous foreign correspondents live um, right above me right now there are this is the level in which there are offices and above us there are residences and I know for a fact that Raf Sanchez who was previously the Daily Telegraph's reporter here, the correspondent um, based in the Middle East, was living in this building. When he left, he was replaced by James Rothwell. Where does James Rothwell, uh, Rothwell live? In this building also. I've seen them both walking around, and I've seen other reporters walking around. They, so they, they are that tight together that they even share tips of where to live, what's a nice, where, where are nice places to hang out. And when they do hang out, they're they, they share ideas for stories. Sometimes they're, um, they're, they're to, to go, they'll be talking about uh, where to go and what the latest story is. And when you talk about what the upcoming big story is, if other people are saying that's the, the next big story, you're sure to go to it as well. To the extent that I've been to the Damascus Gate, not far from here, and I've seen times where it's been relatively calm, but I've seen banks of cameras um, and people talking and they're saying that you know, there's, there's expectations that things are going to develop and not much has developed at all. And they are waiting for a story to almost break out. Um, and so in, in, in many senses, I understand the position of a journalist. I don't think the journalists are out to get us far from it, but I also understand how journalists speak to each other and they inform each other. And when you are parachuted in from far away and you don't know, you know your Jaffa Road from Ben Yehuda, you don't know which, uh, which way to go to Tel Aviv and you certainly don't know your way around Ramallah, it's far easier to, to get by when you have friends who help you and when you have Palestinian stringers who say, this is a story, I can fix you up with an interview with this person or that person, that helps feed into the story. Um, stop the share here. And... Moving now into the coverage of the war. So that, all of that is just background. So we can divide the coverage into three main phases. There's the lead up to the war and there are numerous con contributing factors involved. There's the war itself and then there's the post-war period. And for the purposes of today's session, we won't really be dealing with post-war. One of the most important reasons for that is because there is no real cutoff that I can um, clearly define as to when post-war is, and, and articles still are coming out. Sometimes things come out even months later. So for the moment, I don't think it's fair to analyze the coverage after the war, after the operation. But in the course of today's session, we will be analyzing the lead up to the war and the, the war itself. So in terms of the lead up to the war, I have isolated five, sorry, six even, um, contributing factors. So I'll list them for you now. And as the presentation goes on, I'll refer back to them, but it's important to know them from the outset. So the first is the worsening of Hamas and Fatah relations as the elections were canceled. So earlier this year, there were supposed to be elections in the Palestinian Authority for the first time in around 15 years, I believe, and they were canceled. That created, um, a lot of tension between Hamas and Fatah. Hamas saw itself as being able to rival the ruling party, Fatah. And when Mahmoud Abbas, the, the leader of Fatah, canceled them, the, the elections, um, it, it led to a situation in which Hamas sought to prove itself as the true leaders of the, of the Palestinian people. And that is crucial for understanding events thereafter. Because you can see very, very clearly in, in the months thereafter, there was a, 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 um, a worsening of relations and there were also firing of rockets um, even before the, the outbreak of, war, of, of hostilities in early May. About a month previously, there was also a case in which Hamas fired rockets at Israel, 
completely unrelated to everything else that happens. There were already tensions between Hamas and Fatah, and when um, those two are at each other's uh, throats, as it were, one of the ways that Hamas proves itself is by launching attacks against Israeli civilians, against Israel, and we have to take that into account. Um, the second contributing factor is what was called in the Israeli media as the TikTok Intifada. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, there was a wave of attacks that took place in Israel in which Palestinian youths recorded attacks, random attacks on Israelis. Um, it's good that I'm speaking to a British audience because you may remember in 2005, there was a wave of what was called then happy slapping in which thugs, um, louts, decided that they would use the, uh, this new founder, this, this new technology of a camera phone to record them attacking random people. Um, and that's happening again now, or, or it was back then, it was happening about two months ago, um, with a twist that this was being recorded by Palestinians um, on Jewish uh, civilians and uploaded to TikTok for likes and reactions. Um, after that, there was a response by Jewish nationalists led by the far right figure Itamar Ben Gvir, um, who's now a member of Knesset. And the, his name, I'm sure, will elicit some strong emotions from many of you. Um, so there's, that was also a contributing factor. The third contributing factor is the Sheikh Jarrah, um, also known as Shimon Hadzadik, land dispute, which had um, significant ramifications as. Palestinian families that had been on that site for many years. Um, after a court ruling many years ago, they were told that to stay there because there are Jewish um, families who could prove that they originally owned the land. They were told that they could stay there so long as they pay rent. Uh, for years, they, re they refused to pay rent. It's gone to the high court and it's now looking like uh, they are going to be going back to the high court very soon. Um, and there are tensions over that um, there are those who call it ethnic cleansing, there are those who are saying it's a land dispute and it's, uh, it's simply the, you know, the law that you have to pay rent and if you don't, you are going to be thrown out. Um, but being in East Jerusalem, of course, it has significant ramifications. Um, the fourth contributing factor is the policing of Ramadan pilgrims and the masses gathering at the Damascus Gate. Um, so when Ramadan starts, masses of Palestinians, not just from within Israel, but from within the West Bank, come to Jerusalem to pray on the Temple Mount in Al-Aqsa. And um, given all that, that had been happening up until then, the decision was taken by the Israeli police to block off the Damascus Gate um, from gathering. So they put up barricades so that people couldn't sit there. So for those of you who don't know what the Damascus Gate is like, it's a fairly iconic location at the edge of the old city. It's an exit and entrance to the old city. And a bit like an amphitheater, there are steps leading up and people sit on those steps and they gather there. Certainly during Ramadan, after breaking their fast, it's a place where people would hang out. But the Israeli police decided that given all that had been going on beforehand, it would be a wise idea to just place barricades in rows so that people would be forced to basically leave the Damascus gate and, and bypass the, uh, the steps, just go straight up them without being allowed to sit down there. Um, that caused a bottleneck, it caused um, significant pushback um, and there was writing there thereafter. Um, so that's also a contributing factor. The, the last two are the Jerusalem, flag, um, Jerusalem Day flag march in which um, there isn't, a, a nationalist element in which there are those who go through the Damascus Gate area as well. And sometimes it's not pleasant. There are those who, who um, chant um, loudly and it's somewhat provocatively, but it, also, it should also be mentioned, those are a tiny minority. I'm talking about less than 5%, maybe even less than 1% of, uh, of those attending. Um, so, of those attending the vast majority behave themselves, but there is an element uh, that attends um, and it does get coverage repeatedly year after year in the media uh, of these Israeli nationalists um, rubbing it, um, rubbing the Palestinians' noses in it that they lost the war in, of 1967. So that this coincided with all of the above. And then as a result, result of all the above, 
Um, the tensions were very, very high. There were riots on the Temple Mount, and there was a strong police response to that um, in and around the Al-Aqsa Mosque, including uh, the, uh, um, the Israeli police going into Al-Aqsa Mosque, throwing stun grenades and clearing people out, um, which is described in some parts of the media as a raid. And we'll get to that later, but there's a number of factors already. This is before we even discuss the, uh, the reporting. There's a, lot to, there's a lot to chew over here, and you certainly can't attribute what happened in the days after to any one given cause. Um, so if we just have a look here. Um, so the ZF contact, contacted me about a month ago, and we agreed to collaborate on a study of the British media. Um, and just to explain what I've done, in the course of this undertaking, I've studied big data, that sets of data so large that it would be impossible to analyze all the components individually. So what can we do? We can arrive at conclusions regarding the big picture. I hope you find the results informative. I certainly was interested by what I found. And speaking as someone who typically deals with individual articles and criticizing and analyzing the, uh, the bias and uh, misrepresent uh, misrepresentations that take place in the, uh, the micro level. Um, and also just to have beliefs about the media in general, it's another thing entirely to see, entirely to see those beliefs grounded in numbers and cold statistics. So, um, going in order from the month of Ramadan began, um, began on April 13th. A few days later, on April 16th, began the first in a wave of attacks shared on TikTok. And I'll just show you some of these TikTok attacks, just so you understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so hopefully you should be able to see this. This is one man who was walking his dog and he was attacked. He described it later as being beaten to within an inch of his life. Um, I'll show you another attack. Actually, yeah, that's a, uh, an ultra-Orthodox man, most likely not Zionist. I'm actually going to go back to that first attack and just to show you something in the background. Um, you can see, if you, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm in the center of the screen, you can see a blaze. Um, there was rioting going on already. This is April the 24th. You can see in these tweets. They made it to the Israeli media, um, but they didn't make it to the international media very much. And so we did research and we counted um, from the from the, uh, the wave of attacks beginning on April 16th till May the 9th, that's the day the war broke out, there were 344 articles in the British media relating to TikTok and Israel. And the, the way that we conducted this um, survey, this um, research, sorry, we used a big data tool that allowed us to scan the entire media and I located the search just within the United Kingdom, um, just articles in English, and I searched for specific key phrases. So we searched here for TikTok and we searched for Israel. Um, so this actually would include anything to do with TikTok and Israel. Um, and so there's actually a chance that we might have overestimated the number of articles. So there are 344 articles in the British media that, that would include also lots of small uh, local papers as well. We would re um, refer to websites you may never have heard of, but we're talking about the media in its entirety. Now we'll contrast that with the following. Um, Palestinian protests began on the 5th of May, so sometime later in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, clashes soon spread to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, to Lod, Ramallah, other localities in Israel and the West Bank. Um, and I can show you articles about that. If I show you. Uh, 
Okay, so you have here, for example, a fairly good article by James Rothwell, who I mentioned before in the Daily Telegraph, and he talks about the fact that in Lodz, for example, a number of synagogues were, were burned by Arabs who were rioting there. Um, just so you understand what was happening at the time, um, Arab residents of Israel um, started in numerous places going wild. There's no other way to put it. So you had mobs gathering. You saw um, images and videos being recorded by, the, by these Arabs and they then got out to the wider Israeli media and you could see people scaling lampposts and tearing down the Israeli flag, putting up uh, Palestinian flags, setting homes and cars alight, throwing rocks at bystanders. Um, it started very clearly with Arab residents of Israel attacking their neighbors. Um, and then you saw how the media responded to it. And it was, for, for the most part, there, was dis there, was, there wasn't much interest. But then when Israeli Jews responded, you could see that that's when the story began. So this is, we'll just go back. That one was on 15th of May. Uh, this is the 12th of May, so fine. So this, is, this isn't the best example, but you can certainly see here the way that the Guardian framed it at least was um, Israeli city of Lodz descends into civil war. We have here far-right Jewish groups and Arab youths claim the streets of Lodz. They're trying to equivocate here. Um, you have the AP talking about ethnic violence rocking Israel and framing it as Arabs citing deep grievances when this is, these are louts. And you can see here incinerating people's cars. That's not <laughs> um, citing deep grievances. And we have here another article from the AP, mixed city of Arab, Arabs and Jews remain on edge after violence. Um, these are articles that were um, appearing in the media. And for the most part, there wasn't much interest until Jews were taking part to their shame. There were, there were Jews who were looking for people to beat up as well. Um, there was also an element of Jews, um, Israeli, uh, Israeli Jews, who went to these cities, they knew that they had guns. Although there is the possibility of any Israeli citizen getting a gun license, most Israelis don't have. And so those who do felt a sense of solidarity and there were groups that organized and said, we're going to go to Lod and to Ramla and to Akko. These are mixed cities in which Arabs and Jews uh, coexist to some extent. And they said, we have to go there. Things are disintegrating. We have to go and look after our brothers and sisters, our, um, our fellow Israelis. Um, and many of the people who went to these, to these cities were going there ostensibly as defenders, not attackers. But there were, were also unquestionably those who took part in rioting themselves. But there, there can be no um, comparison whatsoever. There was um, rioting that was instigated by Palestinian, by um, Arab residents of Israel. And yet they, uh, the, there were numerous reports, and I'll just switch back now. I go back to our data and our findings. Um, so if you go back to clashes, for example, um, we have 1.54K articles referring to clashes, um, specifically near the Damascus Gate. And we have, you know, clashes as well, um, also featured um, very highly. And Sheikh Jarrah, for example, um, featured regularly too, with 1.47K, that's 1,470 um, media mentions. Um, so as, as all this was happening, the media, were, the, the narrative was very clear. Rather than focus on rioting, widespread rioting throughout Israel, the media were talking about clashes that are happening near the, the Damascus Gate um, and referring to Israeli forces who were taking on um, Palestinian rioters. We'll get to that in a moment. And Sheikh Jarrah, um, which was the, the land dispute we referred to before. Um, and though that's the narrative being formed right there. That's the big picture. We saw lots and lots of articles about these things. Um, and just to go and share my screen with you again, I can refer to these things. I think I'm getting the hang of it by now. So I now I'm sharing you 200 injured type set. This. So 
the far more common narrative were articles like this. So we have more than 205 Palestinians wounded in Jerusalem Al-Aqsa clashes. They focused on a specific place. Um, obviously, it is of more significance. But what's really interesting here, you talk about Palestinians being wounded and you think, oh, that's terrible. You look at this image and what's really, what really leaps out at me is that I can see at least four, two very clearly, two very clear um, fireworks detonating in the air. If you look at the extreme right of the picture, it looks like there's a third and on the floor in the center, it looks like there's a fourth there. So there are numerous fireworks detonating. Now this is Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is a Muslim holy site. Um, and what are fireworks doing there? The, and in fact, if I search the article, I don't know if you can see this as well, but I just search for firework, just in this one particular article, so it's really granular. Um, Oliver Holmes hasn't mentioned fireworks even once in this article. He's not mentioned the fact that Israeli police were coming under attack. There were these fireworks are makeshift weapons that were being used as missiles and they were being fired at the Israeli armed forces who were there to restore order to the site. Um, I don't remember if it was that day specifically, but certainly at one point, I think it was in the ninth, actually, no, it wasn't the 8th of May, um, but it was at night time. So it was after this article was, was, um, was written and filed. But that night, the Temple Mount is directly over, um, directly above, the Kotel, the Western or Wailing Wall, and Jews praying there were forced to flee um, because rocks were thrown at them from above. And the following day, missiles were, or at least one missile was, um, it was an attempt to fire one at Jews praying beneath. And that didn't actually um, go as planned. It set a tree alight. And that actually set off a wave of fake news in which people um, were blaming Israelis and Jews for setting the Al-Aqsa Mosque alight. And it was completely the, um, the reverse. Um, not that the media itself fell for that, um, but it's important also to understand what's happening at the same time as the media are um, sharing this kind of story. Um, so we saw also this kind of um, narrative so beefed up israeli police clash with palestinians in jerusalem but why are they clashing with the palestinians we understand but it's not coming across in the media at all um, we have this filed by sky news again it talks about the numbers injured and it, again from the headline alone people just don't understand here again we see fireworks this is obviously in another location somewhere nearby so clearly fireworks are part of the picture Again, I'm sorry if you can't see it. I've searched for firework again. Fireworks do not appear in this article either. Um, you have Jerusalem, um, Israeli police clash with Palestinians in, in Jerusalem. This is the BBC. Um, many injured on second night of clashes. Um, more from the, the Daily Mail, um, the May, <laughs> Daily Mail, making a meal out of it, one could say, calling it barbaric attacks in the mosque. Um, and this is an article that I wrote as a response. Um, and you got a very good response. We got a lot of people reading this and sharing this. Um, so thank you for all of our follow to all of our followers who read honest reporting and share our content. It really is um, greatly appreciated. I wrote this article um, shortly there um, thereafter, um, saying that the media missed the real story as Palestinians riot on the Temple Mount. So I'll just close this now. I can stop the share. Um, and I'll show you one last thing before I progress. I can find it. Ah, oh, hang on. I think I know what it is. Excuse me. I have to open it up first. Please bear with me. Share screen. Okay, so this. 
And this is just taken from the BBC website. So this is even, isn't even something I can easily show in my big data, but I can show you granularly. I can show you the, uh, um, the things that the big data can't pick up on. So as you can see here, the, um, the BBC explainer video says it all started in Sheikh Jarrah, a, video, uh, a neighborhood in Jerusalem, completely ignoring all the other factors. Um, so that, that's something that, that um, has just been overlooked. Um, and if we compare, um, compare all that again, so we have 1.54,000, 54K articles referring to clashes near the Damascus Gate, 1.47K mentions of Sheikh Jarrah, the flag march um, in Jerusalem, um, references to Jerusalem Day turned up 890 times. Compare those large figures with a much smaller figure of 344 times in which the British media related to TikTok and Israel. Um, so the numbers speak for themselves. The, and, it, and it should also be clear, articles can focus on one thing or another. I understand that journalists will have a particular viewpoint. They might see things differently to the way you or I do. But what I think, not just you in the audience, uh, you, who many of you will agree with me, but also journalists should be able to recognize themselves is that the facts should be included. The, all of the facts should be included. And they should be mentioning the fact that these TikTok attacks were occurring. Um, it doesn't have to be given necessarily the focus that you or I would want, but the very fact that they're just not being mentioned anywhere near as much is deeply problematic. Um, the, there's another conclusion we've arrived at following the data. Um, so the scrapped Palestinian elections, which I spoke about earlier, um, which were called um, for on January 15th by Mahmoud Abbas and were canceled on 29th of April. That's just under a month um, before they were actually due to be held on the 22nd of May. Um, they warranted only 370 mentions before the war and during the war, 901 mentions. And the way we found that information was again, we searched for Palestinian elections, Palestinian elections, so rather Palestinian elections or election, singular and plural. We also searched for canceled elections and post postponed elections. We put all of that together so there's actually a chance we've overstated how many mentions. So that's 901 mentions but, um, during the war, plus the 370 before. Um, and you'll see how many um, articles came out in total over the course of the war. It was something like 30,000. So just over 1,000 mentions the uh, Palestinian elections, um, which Many analysts attribute, um, and they describe this as being the reason why the war took place, um, took place in the first place. Um, Hamas spoiling for a fight, looking to prove itself as the legitimate, quote unquote, um, leaders of the Palestinian people, um, um, looked for a pretext to start the war. That was very clear in what happened on, on May the 9th, in which they issued an ultimatum saying, unless the Jerusalem Day flag parade will be cancelled, we'll fire uh, rockets upon Israel. So they telegraphed very clearly, they said, we will commit a war crime, we will fire rockets at Israeli population centers unless we get our way in. And that's, uh, their way was for the flag march to be, um, to be call, uh, called off, and for Sheikh Jarrah, um, for that um, court case not to be heard, for the Palestinians to continue living there without paying rent. So Israel, of course, said we won't be dictated to by Hamas. It didn't call off the flag march. Um, and at six o'clock that day, Hamas fired rockets at Jerusalem. Um, of course, that wasn't fully described in the media either. Um, but again, all of this was happening. It's very clear that this was a pretext um, for Hamas to gain leverage. Now, don't, don't forget, both of these events have been happening for years. The, uh, the court case has been through the high court many times, previ uh, many times previously. Never has Hamas threatened uh, to fire rockets at Jerusalem because you know there's the threat of evictions. Uh, the Jerusalem, flag, um, Jerusalem Day flag march also happens year after year after year. And yes, it is something that um, sparks tensions. 
rightly or wrongly. Um, again, it's never been a time where Hamas has said, well, if you can't, unless you cancel it, we're going to um, fire rockets at Israel. Um, very clearly, this was a pretext to start war. Uh, and nevertheless, despite the fact that Hamas was itching for a fight, um, this essential background information just wasn't mentioned um, in the vast majority of articles. Another aspect that our big data uh, yields is that something that's well known to many of you, Hamas uses human shields. Um, and even as Israel conducted one of the most targeted military campaigns in history, it couldn't avoid the fact that civilians would get hurt. It was simply put unavoidable. Um, and whereas one can make the case that on individual strikes, maybe Israel could have done things differently. Overall, it was there were, it was an it was an inevitability that civilians would get hurt. So we found that if we search for Gaza, there are 31.7 case stories, 31,000 stories uh, about Gaza over the course of the war. Um, and then when we searched for Gaza in conjunction with one of the following terms, human shield or human shields, plural, we found that there were just 1.66 case stories. So one. 1,600 roughly, 1,700 stories out of 31,000 or 32,000 stories, the overwhelming majority of stories just did not mention the fact that Hamas uses human shields. Um, and again, it's something that the media know, it's something that is document, documented by almost every single media out there, that's out there. They know that this happens, they've covered it before, but they don't but they choose not to bring it up time after time. And I think that's interesting because if we will compare, for example, um, whenever there's a story about settlements, for example, um, you'll often see a paragraph that will say, settlements are considered illegal under international law, but Israel disputes this. That, that's boilerplate. That is something that is copied and pasted from article to article. Um, and it's so easy to include texts like that about human shields, but yet the, the media as a whole, journalists time after time, decided that it is not worth including. And that vital context is not passed on to readers back home, it's not passed on to viewers, and therefore people just don't know about it. It's, it's a talking point of the uh, pro-Israel uh, pro crowd and of the right, whereas it, it shouldn't be. It should be part of the narrative for everybody. Um, also ignored, um, we searched for rockets falling in Gaza. So just so those of you uh, who aren't aware, according to some estimates, over 600 rockets fired from Gaza landed in Gaza. Um, there were infrequent articles which documented these cases. Um, 780 mentions when we searched for Gaza and rocket together with one of fell short, fall short, landed in Gaza or fell in Gaza. So again, when we're talking about 30 point something K or 31 point something K, so 30,000 articles and less than 1,000 of them refer to the fact that many of the rockets fired Hamas fell in Gaza. And there, there were articles that described um, the fact that Palestinians wounded in Gaza and killed in Gaza were killed by Palestinian rockets. Now, once that's happened, the, the media and journalists have a choice. They can either integrate that into the narrative or let it go. And overwhelmingly, they chose not to remind readers of the fact that some of the uh, those wounded and killed in Gaza were wounded and killed by Palestinian rockets. Um, so again, the media has been selective in what it tells people back home. Um, another finding that we have, no, actually, before I, uh, before I do that, I should also mention just in my notes here, um, there, there was a flood of sob stories. We saw many human interest stories um, talking about people in Gaza and how they're suffering. We're, we're so used to that. And we can, I can understand also as somebody who was a journalist um, that if it bleeds, it leads. And if there's destruction, if there's a visual of a collapsed building or of multiple collapsed buildings one after the other, that's a strong visual that a journalist will go to. That's the place where they set up their camera, they stand in front of the camera with the 
uh, you know, the collapsed buildings behind them. And it makes for compelling television. It makes for um, a, a good image for a newspaper um, or a website. So I, I can understand also, and not even the, the, um, the buildings, but also the fact there were many more deaths in Gaza. It's unavoidable. We have to recognize that. And I can understand why reporters went to, to Gaza to talk about all of that. However, while doing all of that, it, it's so important that they talk about human shields. Um, and if you don't talk about the fact that civilian uh, areas are being bombed because that's where Hamas assets are, then the whole story is never going to come out. Um, and so we have that, and we also have another aspect, which is that hard questions are typically asked of Israelis. So the Israeli uh, representatives, um, whether they are military rep uh, representatives, the commanders, the top brass, or if they are politicians or diplomats, they'll face tough questions um, from the BBC or Sky News. Typically, however, they will not be asking hard questions of the, um, the members of Hamas that uh, allow themselves to be interviewed. First of all, because Hamas typically aren't too keen to, uh, to allow themselves to be interviewed unless they know exactly what's going to be happening. Uh, and even then, after the fact, there have been instances in which um, Hamas has destroyed footage uh, that is inconvenient to it. Um, they tightly control where journalists go and do not go in Gaza. And journalists know that if they put out footage, if they put out coverage that is too critical of Hamas, then they risk losing access to the Gaza Strip. And the Gaza Strip, after all, is governed by Hamas with an iron fist. They con completely control the story. And so therefore, journalists aren't at liberty to this, in the same way they are in Israel. And so the entire picture is, is distorted. Um, so one last finding. Um, hang on. Okay, so then there's the death counts. Um, the death counts overwhelmingly failed to distinguish between Gazan civilians and terrorists. Um, so of the 20.5K, so 20,000 20, um, 20, roughly uh, results that we have for Gaza, um, in conjunction with killed or dead, so we search for those terms using our software. So 20,000 articles that uh, were written between May the 9th and May the 22nd, just 128 of those refers to combatants. So that's just one term that would distinguish between a, a person who's killed who is a member of Hamas and a person who is killed who is not. We widened the search and we searched for civilians because that's a, a, a term that's far more likely to be used. Um, and we found that when civilians are part of the search, then we have 10,000 mentions um, so again, so that's 10,000 mentions out of 20,000 articles. Um, so roughly half of the articles do not make clear the distinction between civilians being killed and um, combatants being killed. And we've also done another search, 10.4K um, mentions for, the, for that base search of Gaza plus, Gaza plus killed slash dead. Um, we also search for militants. Um, so we've, we've run multiple permutations in an attempt to determine exactly how many articles make clear how many of those kills were combatants, um, whether they were on um, whether they were part of Hamas or Islamic Jihad, or whether they were civilians, and it's abundantly clear that the vast uh, majority of them uh, do not. Sorry, or it's not the vast majority. Roughly half of them, um, and I actually should say might. Um, um, define them as civilians or not, uh, or militants, because even if they are talking about militants in an article, as we have 10.4K mentions for militants, it doesn't necessarily make clear in the search whether the militants was in reference to people being killed or another part of the article when the article talks about 
militant group, for example, or the militants did X, Y, and Z. Um, but at, at the very most, 10.4K of them did refer to militants being killed. So we know that roughly 10,000 results at the very least didn't identify uh, those being killed as members um, of a terror organization. Uh, and therefore, the big picture that is emerging is that people reading these articles don't know um, whether the people being killed are terrorists or not. The media have failed to distinguish between them and therefore people at home are just reading a death count, a number, decontextualized, doesn't mean anything. Um, however many people have died in Gaza, that's how many people they're hearing about and they think to themselves, oh, that's terrible. And they don't find out that much later as um, information has come out and Israeli intelligence and independent intelligence estimates have, have seeped out, we understand that roughly for every civilian killed, there's been a member of Hamas or Islamic Jihad who has been killed. So the ratio is actually closer to one to one. Um, so that has just not been transmitted in the media. Um, just going to show you my uh, cue. Um, one other thing which isn't um, coming across in our uh, in our big data share screen and that is this story which you might have heard of um, this is a significant success for honest reporting it came out after the the operation ended um, I don't know if amongst the audience, we might have a member of the Twitter account, Nasha Jew, but we are indebted to them. They've done some wonderful research over the years in exposing anti-Semites in the Labour Party and beyond. Um, they scour uh, Twitter and other social media for anti-Semitism, espoused by leading individuals or people involved in politics. And they found out that a journalist by the name of Tala Halawa um, I'll just show you the tweet in large here. Um, so she was at the time in 2014, a, a journalist working for a Palestinian radio station. She was living in Ramallah at the time. And she tweeted this, Israel is more Nazi than Hitler. Oh, Hitler was right. IDF go to hell, pray for Gaza. Years after that, and uh, so that was in 2014, so about two and a half years later, in, in 2017, she was hired by the BBC. Um, and this tweet came to light only recently from uh, Nasha Jew, it came to our attention. And so we put this tweet out there ourselves, outing her. Uh, she is a digital journalist for the BBC, we wrote. She directly influences and creates content watched by many millions around the world. In what world can someone like this work for a professional news outlet? And this tweet, as you can see, went viral. Um, it got 2.2K um, shares, uh, 3.4K um, likes. And if I just show you the analytics, I think this is particularly cool. There are around 200 um, Twitter users this tweet got almost 2 million impressions. So roughly, this is in rough terms because some people could have seen a tweet more than once, but roughly, um, if my maths are correct, um, one in every 100 Twitter users saw this tweet of ours by Honest Reporting. Um, it was retweeted um, by many leading members of the Twitterati, we can call them. Um, and the... Um, the coverage was widespread. It got into the Daily Telegraph, the Spectator, the Sun, the Daily Mail, Fox News got on it. It got to the point where even the, the BBC itself had to talk about it. They opened an investigation. A few weeks went by, and as you know, the BBC weren't exactly, um, they're, not the, they're not going to be doing anything other than stiff up a lip if they, if they can. But it got to the point where they were forced um, due to massive public pressure uh, to do something about it and quietly after 
um, after being prodded again and again, they released a statement saying that this individual no longer works for the BBC. So they released her or she resigned one or the other. She no longer works for the BBC. So we have had some su success there. Um, and just so you understand, this was somebody who, as you can see in this article from the BBC, um, she's referred to as the BBC Monitoring's Tala Halawa. Um, this article, I'll just refresh for you now so you can see, this still appears on the BBC website. So to this day, Tala Halawa's reporting, maybe I can even just set it to play. I don't see that. Uh, I can just maybe just see at the very beginning of this video. Clicking through social media, you can. That's Tala right there. And so her reporting is still live on the BBC website. So not good enough. They've allowed it to stay up. This particular article video um, video post is quite horrific in which she um, whitewashes what um, Bella Hadid, who's very influential on Instagram, and she put out some vile Instagram posts. Uh, and instead of accurately describing what Bella Hadid uh, said, instead we have this article on the on the BBC website, which um, whitewashes really what was being said there, and it still hasn't disappeared. So that that's not going to be brought up in the big data, but it's important for you to understand the big picture here. Um, back to me, I'm just going to go and share with you my uh, final thoughts. So our key findings from this research, British media have overwhelmingly overlooked Palestinian violence and intra-Palestinian politics and the role that they played in the lead up to the fighting in May. The British media have also repeatedly failed to mention the Hamas policy of using civilians as human shields. Another finding, our third finding, is that British news outlets fail to distinguish between civilians and terrorists killed in Gaza. And our fourth point is that there has been an unwillingness to document TikTok attacks and Hamas grievances um, with Abbas and Fatah. And it's compounded by the media's selective memory that even once these events have been recorded in parts of the media, they are generally ignored later on in analysis and backgrounds. And readers are told that the cause of the conflict lay elsewhere. Um, I'd like to conclude with this, that reporting is not simply saying that one side says this and another side says that. He says, she says, isn't journalism. If one person is saying it's daytime and another person is saying it's nighttime, it's the job of the journalist to stick the neck around the door and determine if the sun is shining or not. Um, Unfortunately, the situation here is even worse sometimes because the journalists are adopting the Palestinian narrative that, that this is all Israel's um, fault. It's all because Israel um, was heavy handed in its policing on the, tem on the Temple Mount, or it's because Israel um, is being unfair with regards to Sheikh Jarrah. And they're adopting one particular narrative over the other. Um, sometimes it's clearly false. Sometimes it's debatable, but as a whole, that, that is the big picture. Uh, and in effect, such reporting isn't just hostile to Israel, it's hostile to the truth. Uh, and it's no surprise that when the events here in Israel and, and in the region are reported thus, and at a time when fake news is rife and spreads through social media like wildfire, I'll just give you an example of some of this fake news. Just today, um, this is something most of you would not have seen, but on Arab language social, social media and in English and being shared by, uh, I would imagine many Muslims and those sympathetic to the Palestinian cause. There was a, uh, a video showing Cristiano Ronaldo walking past a figure um, snubbing him, it would seem. That's what the video said. It's a video that very clearly, if you understand football, it was a, uh, a medal ceremony. And the subtitle on the video was that this was an Israeli and therefore Cristiano Ronaldo snubbed him. And it said that Cristiano Ronaldo was all, always with the Palestinians. Now, the Associated Press did a fact check of that and they found that it's nonsense. This is an old video. They found the original and it's simply because it was a final in which Ronaldo's team lost. He didn't want his loser's medal and therefore he walked away. He wasn't interested. Um, and that has been rebranded. Um, that, that kind of thing is rife in social media. Things are repackaged on a daily basis. 
um, and they are misrepresented. Um, and I can end with a slight positive in that the Associated Press took, uh, took it upon themselves to fact check this and they revealed that it's not the case. What we really need to see is more of that. Um, and not just with things that are relatively easy to fact check, which is a video which one can search for using tools on, uh, on Google, for example, and reverse until they find the original, but they need to be um, doing that for the coverage in general. Um, because un until, until that point, as ever, it all started when Israel fired back. Um, I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm now going to um, pass it over to Steve. I believe Steve has collated some uh, questions for me and I'll be happy to take some from you. Well, thank you, Emmanuel. Um, that was a, a very, a very good and, and, and fascinating insight into the way that, that the media here covered the, the recent operation and the events leading up to it. So, so thank you for the, the, the research. Um, we've got quite a few few questions here, so I think I'll just start from the very beginning. Um, so we've got one member of the audience has said that they 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 have heard quite a few talks from people from from your organisation from honest reporting, um, but that they have yet to see any changes in the way the BBC deals with Israel. Um, as an avid listener to the BBC World Service, living in Israel, um, it seems that their reporting is more biased than ever. Can you comment on that? <laughs> um, I think we have to be realistic here, first of all. Unfortunately, Honest Reporting isn't a very large organization. The BBC is massive. Um, what we do like to think is that by our organization continuing to document instances of bias, the BBC and other organizations know that there are certain boundaries that they are restricted to. Um, certainly in the case of Tala Halawa, she couldn't continue working. Her, her position was rendered untenable. Um, so that certainly is a change. Unfortunately, the organization do, does, have, does have its um, biases, the narratives that it continues to propagate. Um, and until such a time as it changes, which doesn't seem particularly likely, we'd have to continue documenting it and putting out uh, the facts. We are, however, getting more and more proficient in new, um, newer forms of social media. We have a very strong YouTube presence. We are getting Instagram uh, into Instagram in, in right now, actually. Um, we're taking that very seriously and seeing growth in that arena. And with any luck in, in, on those fronts, we can impact the, the younger generation. Um, and get them to apply pressure to the BBC. Um, but if, if you want us to succeed in changing the entire narrative of the BBC, if only, if only we could, you know, could have that kind of strength, but we have to have, uh, we have to adjust our expectations, unfortunately. Here we are thinking that the Zionists have control of the media. <laughs> <laughs> um, why we've got another question here um do you think that journalists even want to report fairly when the anti-israel populations are so much bigger than the pro or at least neutral to israel numbers are uh, could they feel intimidate intimidated to do so given the physical threats um that they face that they may face when in gaza and other islamic i got a glitch i didn't know who that they are sorry uh, sorry I, I, there was a glitch. I didn't know who the they are. Who's the they who are being intimidated? Maybe, maybe repeat. Yes. Do you think the? So let me just repeat that last bit then. Do you think that the um, the the journalists are intimidated to report in 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 a particular way, um, especially when you know they're based in areas like Gaza? Um, given that given that Gaza doesn't have a free press, whereas Israel has a has a very free press. Absolutely. Um, we know that there is a member of the UN who, yeah. um, I think, member of UNRWA, the U United Nations Reliefs and Works Agency, which is the refugee, the only refugee agency in the world that is set up to help a specific population, the Palestinian population. So there's a UN refu refugee uh, organization um, body for the entire world, and there's one specifically for the Palestinians. Uh, and a member of that organization, based in Gaza, said 
um, things that confirmed the truth. Um, he confirmed that Israel was targeting Hamas and he was effectively declared a persona non grata. He was told that he had to leave um, Gaza. He was therefore forced, um, he was removed from his post. Um, and that sends out a very strong message to journalists. If you cross a certain line, then you too will not be welcome back. You will lose your post here. You will have to find another job. We will have to find another job within your organization. Um, and nobody wants to get posted here and then suddenly be uh, shunted back out, out, out there. So um, I understand that they are intimidated. Having said that, that does not absolve journalists from telling more of the story. If we can't expect them to tell the whole truth, at least tell more of the truth. Certainly, things like I, the things that I was referring to, um, the raw data shows that time after time, um, they just aren't mentioning things at all. So it's not a question of even what you give more emphasis to. They're just certain things just are not being mentioned. Hamas human shields, for example. I would understand that a journalist might be reticent to write an entire article just about that, but I see no reason why articles cannot be written in which human shields are mentioned two, three, four, five, six paragraphs down. At least mention it, but no, they're not. So I can't, I can't absolve them of, of blame here. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Balin report? Um, I see that hum uh, honest, re honest reporting has 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 created a petition um, mm -hmm. about the Balin report. Um, it would be good if you could just mention what your what your goals are in that respect. Sure, I can I can tell you that we have now working for honest reporting a gentleman by the name of David Menser. He used to be part of Labour Friends for Israel. We have a range of opinion in the organization, by the way. We aren't uh, um, politically aligned one way or another. There are certainly right-wing and certainly left-wing voices in the organization. Uh, but that's, uh, that's who David worked for in the past. Um, and he has connections. And he um, has spoken to members of parliament. And over the last month, we've had there have been two members of parliament who have raised the, uh, the Balin report in, uh, in parliament. Um, so we are seeing some pressure being applied. Um, if we are realistic, the BBC has spent hundreds of thousands of pounds burying this thing. So it is highly unlikely it is suddenly going to fold now. But what we can do is by showing the, um, the media, if we get enough people to sign this petition, um, and we can say there are thousands of people who are petitioning for this thing to, to be released, we can, get, we can get that into reports in the Jewish media and hopefully into the wider media. And again, just make, we can make, make ourselves a thorn in the BBC's side. So uh, I'll take this opportunity to ask you to all to go to our, our website, find our petition, and please do share it with your friends. Um, the more people that sign up, the more of a likelihood, the more of a chance we have of um, getting ourselves in the media ourselves. Um, with the uh, the pressure being applied on the BBC. I mean, we, we, we could say that um, with the BBC reeling from the recent um, Bashir investigation that perhaps now is an opportune time for, for the pressure to be put on. Um, could say. Ratch it up. We could say that, but um, exactly as we discovered this thing with Tala Halawa, um, it was the week after um, what was happening then and my gut instinct was they're going to brush it under the carpet as much as they possibly can. They can't, they can't deal with um, two fronts. And I wasn't surprised when the BBC's initial reaction was a short statement saying we are opening an investigation without giving any more away. And they said nothing more until a few weeks later when the JC um, wrote a leader in which they mentioned this and in which we, uh, we and other organizations continued lobbying behind the scenes. And they then said, they said, issued a very terse statement saying she no longer works for the BBC. Um, they issued no um, real, there was, there's, there was no, um, they weren't contrite. There was no apology. Uh, and certainly there was no statement in which they reassured the Jewish community that they will take steps to ensure 
that this will not happen again and that they will vet journalists. And we're talking about an organization that has the resources um, to fund Panorama and investigate public bodies, individuals, large other corporations. Um, how hard is it for the BBC to conduct a five minute Twitter search? And certainly for a Palestinian journalist, it's, it's really easy just to type in on Twitter, Israel or Palestine or Jews. Um, and if they're concerned about political correctness, then they could do it for all journalists. They don't have to make it about that particular journalist. But there should be certain terms that people should be vetted for. And nevertheless, an organization of such financial strength and with such resources couldn't do it and refuses to do it, it would seem. Okay. Um, are, there, are there any legal ways to combat inaccurate reporting? Uh, we actually have articles on the, BB, uh, on the Honest Reporting website about can you sue the media for bias. So bias you cannot. Um, if there's a particular angle that's being covered a lot more than another, unfortunately not. Um, but uh, if they have signed up to um, the, uh, the, the moral code, the name escapes me right now, I think... And I'm not going to embarrass myself by saying it wrong, but I, I can look for it um, for you in the meantime. Beauties of doing a, uh, a cert, uh, of doing a presentation on Zoom, um, but I can tell you that if, as was the case with um, the Guardian many years ago, the Guardian refused to here. I can, I'm pulling up the article right now. Um, refused to refer to the capital of Israel as Jerusalem, uh, and it would refer to Tel Aviv. Um, ah, there's a pre the Press Complaints Commission, the PCC, um, um, has a clause on accuracy. So if there is a factual error um, and the body in question, the organization in question has signed up to that particular um, uh, the statement saying that they have to be accurate, then we can then we can then take them to court. Uh, and that was the case many years ago when Honours Reporting threatened um, legal action against the Guardian because it refused to refer to um, Israel's capital as Jerusalem. It kept on saying Tel Aviv. Uh, and for those of you who might wonder why that's such an issue, just for, put Jerusalem aside for a second, Tel Aviv never was the capital of Israel. Um, it certainly is not right now. It's like calling Be uh, Birmingham or Brighton the capital of England or the, of the UK. Um, you know, just why, why, that, why that city? It's clearly not true. It's clearly not accurate. Um, so we threaten legal action and they back down and subsequently, very infrequently, they, hit, they, they, um, they, do, they commit that particular crime. But when we uh, catch them, we let them know, we remind them of, of their commitment to calling Jerusalem the capital of Israel, um, or at least not referring to Tel Aviv as the capital of Israel, and, and, and that has ceased for the most part. Okay. Um, I've got another question here uh, that, that you quite rightly comment on the anti-Israel bias of the BBC, but the coverage of the conflict by ITV, Channel 4 and other mainstream channels, there's that term, mainstream channels, isn't much better. Um, what would you say about that and, you know, about your work in, in, in regard to, to those other outlets? Okay, it's a good question. And I, I, it's actually something I should have brought up earlier. The search that I conducted was on the print and the written media, the websites, um, all of this was written text. There was an option using the software that we have to search the broadcast media, but I wasn't sufficiently happy um, with its accuracy, um, partly because the way that broadcast media works, it's just one never ending stream. And so you can have one item referring to um, one particular scenario, one particular segment talking about Jerusalem, the next thing might be talking about for argument's sake, Venezuela. Uh, so there might be hostilities there, there might be a clash there. So if I'm searching for clash and Jerusalem, for example, there could be a false positive there. Um, so in terms of big data, I was concerned and I didn't want to rely on the tool that we have, certainly not without being fully sure that it would be accurate. 
it might it might have been accurate, but I, I just didn't want to take the risk. Um, just as an aside, also, I'll let you know that um, there's a great clip. I can't remember if it's if it's in Yes Prime Minister or Yes Minister. Many of you will know it. Leading questions um, in which um, there's a discussion um, in which uh, the use of polls um, is discussed and um, one person says to another, um, I can phrase things in a certain way. And, you, and, you, and he says, you know, do you agree with national service? Do you believe about this and the, that and the other? Um, and he comes out with, through the use of leading questions at a final question, he asks the correspondent. So he asks the person in front of him. Um, so do you believe that was it? Do you believe in national service? And the person says, yes, of course I do. I believe in personal responsibility. I believe in giving to the country and it follows. He then asked another um, list of questions, which led the person to, do you believe in people having freedom? Do you believe in them being co-opted into doing things? Do you believe they should be, um, be forced into serving the army? The person goes, of course not. So the person then shudders and they realize I've been led, I've been led into saying contradictory statements. And the, uh, the funny part of that is when he goes um, that of course, um, I could um, make all my questions available when I when I publish the results of the survey, but what what uh, what Pulse actually does that? They just announce the 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 key findings. They announce the key questions. Well, I've announced my key findings here. What I will tell you also is that I didn't um, do any more searches than the ones I told you today. I didn't have to um, to search and search and search. What I found is what I've presented. Um, so I haven't been uh, misleading um, using my leading uh, questions or my um, or my uh, so or my research material. I've only selected um, the things that I search for. Um, now, just to go back to the question in terms of the in terms of Channel Four, ITV, Sky News. I agree. There has much of the coverage has been questionable at best. Um, and downright misleading at the worst. Um, unfortunately, there's just so much to cover that I, in particular, I focus on the written media. It's something that's more digestible. It's something that is, um, I, I can feed through this big data tools. Um, what I would say to my readers, um, to, to, to the people here, um, is you are all invited to send me leads if you see something we have a um, an alert button on our home page you can alert us to cases of bias and if you let us know exactly when you saw something on what channel we can access it and otherwise i'm forced to go through hours and hours and hours of footage and sometimes it's things that i don't particularly like but it's not what we would call actionable it's not necessarily something we're going to spend our energies going after um, but if you see something that is particularly egregious, something that demands us um, attacking, then please do get in, um, get in touch. I can also let you know our email address is action at honestreporting.com. I'll just repeat that, action at honestreporting.com. Um, so you can either send us an email there. Um, thank you, Steve. Right, uh, so it's out. wrong. It's sent too soon. Action. Yeah. And you, you can let us know about um, things that are really horrible. I would say to you this, we get many, many emails. So please try and email us only when it's something really is uh, factually incorrect or misses things um, on, on, on a horrible scale. Um, because some people interpret things in, in some ways, some people interpret in, in another way. Uh, and sometimes we are as a consequence forced to say, Yes, we personally agree with you, but it's not waterproof. It's not absolutely solid. Uh, and we can't go after that. Um, and it's important for us to main maintain a good reputation. And we do, maintain, we do have a good, uh, we have a good standing with the journalists. We meet sometimes with the journalists in this building and, and elsewhere. Um, we do let them know that we aren't after them. We do understand that the media have a, an important to, uh, role in democracies. And we certainly don't want to see the media uh, trashed. And we certainly do want them to, to do an important job. 
Um, however, when, when um, there are instances of, instances of faulty reporting, they know that we will be after them. They know that we will be after their colleagues and they, they know um, that um, we, in, gen in general, uh, we're following what's being said. Um, so even if the reporting is bad, um, I'll say that we do have um, some deterrence. And there's something else I can mention. I saw in one of the, the comments that were sent, and just happened to catch my eye, um, we have a subsidiary um, called Media Central. Um, and whereas honest reporting is more of the stick, Media Central is more of a carrot. And what Media Central does is an attempt to bypass the um, GPO to some extent, the government press office, which one of the comments made a disparaging uh, reference to the uh, government press office. Um, I'm not going to say my own opinion, it makes a difference, but what we, what we, tend, what we try to do through Media Central is create an environment in which journalists in the country who want to find out more about a story can come to us for information. So we have a drop-in center um, located not far from here in which journalists can literally set up camp there. They have internet, they have refreshments, they can ask for contacts, whether it's in the military, in the government. Um, and all of that is to bypass not only um, as some of you some of you would like, like the government press office, but, but it's also to go, uh, bypass the Palestinian stringers who will tell them a more pro-Palestinian anti-Israel story. And we connect to them or the, the subsidiary Media Central connects the journalists with um, sources that are far more amenable. And we know that's had an effect because we have even been thanked. The journalists have got back to us and say, thank you. You've helped us um, get our story out there far quicker. We've been far more efficient as journalists. You make our job easier. So however bad it is, believe me when I say it could be a whole lot worse. So at least that's, at least that's, uh, at least that's being worked upon. At least we're doing that. Okay, thanks. Um, a question here: Has anything, has anything since the since the recent hostilities turned up to prove or disprove Iranian encouragement or provocation um, in starting these riots as part of a general attack in tandem with the Gaza rockets? Not something I can comment on. I'm not. I'm not aware of anything uh, either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. It is an interesting question. Right. <laughs> um, Got a question here. I uh, don't know if you can make any observations about it. Working working for a, a media organisation. Um, why this is an observation someone's putting across? Why is so? It's their opinion. Why are the Palestinians so much better than the Israelis in getting their case across? They always go on the offensive, leaving Israeli spokesmen defensive. It never seems to go the other way. And we do see this quite a bit here. We do see, um, we do see that uh, you know the Palestinian side seem to seem to be far more aggressive in in their in their reporting to to news media about the about the situation. Um, what thoughts do you have on that? Right. I'll say that I am thirty four years old. I imagine I'm younger than many in the in the audience. I'm sure many of you are well aware that this is something that's been said for years. I can remember, remember this as, as long as I've been involved in Israel and as long as I've cared about Israel and I've been following the news from England and then when I, when I moved here, that's always been something that people have said. And I think there are a number of factors. One is that there are, um, as I referred to in the course of my presentation towards the very beginning, um, the intermingling of journalists with people who work in human rights organizations. And I use that term loosely. I don't think many of them are exactly um, interested in, in human rights, but they're in, interested in a selective subset of, of, of the humans and, and their rights. Um, but they, uh, they tend to hang out together and um, they also move between these organizations and also um, part of that uh, social um, gathering, you also find um, members of the UN who are also um, posted here in Jerusalem. So they'll go to the same um, house parties and they'll go to the same bars together and their, in, their opinions of inform one another. Um, 
I would add to that um, that there is a, a willingness on the part of the Palestinians to lie more than there is on the part of Israelis. Uh, and I laugh, but it's it's a truth. Um, and you see things, we, we remember years ago, there was this concept that was coined uh, Pallywood, in which videos were meddled with. Um, I think it was Richard Landers, a researcher who coined that term during the second intifada. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing uh, pictures of people um, walking around one moment, hopping, hopping on one foot as if they've been injured or shot at uh, the next, and then uh, after that, they're walking normally again. So um, you can tell that footage has been doctored. You can tell that, um, or more recently, there was a case of an Al Jazeera journalist who was arrested by Israelis. Um, she was reporting on the developments in Sheikh Jarrah, or as it's known to Israelis, Shimon HaTzadik. She was there without her press cards, and only people with press cards were allowed in. She was a journalist, but she didn't have a card on. She got quite uppity <laughs> saying, I have a right to be here, but she didn't have the proper accreditation on her. Uh, and there's even video footage showing her pushing a, a member of the um, border police, um, which is cause for her being arrested. Um, she, after being released, there's a video of her picking up two kids, I believe they're her children, in, in both arms. And then subsequently, there's, um, the, she appeared in front of cameras with a cast on her arm, saying that her arm was broken when she was arrested. So either she had her arm broken and she managed to pick up those kids despite her arm being broken, which I find very hard to believe because she wasn't wincing with pain. She didn't seem to be in any discomfort. Um, and I don't even know if it'd be possible if one has their arms broken, um, but certainly she was exhibiting no discomfort at all, or far more likely she was lying and that this cast was an act. And that I would love to be able to get in touch with the judge. I, I could actually get in touch with a, um, a medical worker there at that hospital. I know people who work in that unit, but that would be a breach of, uh, of uh, medical ethics. So I've, I've not asked them, I won't put them in that position, but it's quite clear to me that um, there is a willingness to lie. Um, so that contributes to why we're on the defensive because a lie is some, isn't something you can predict. Um, by its nature, it's something that comes up out of uh, nowhere. It's from somebody's imagination. Um, there's that and also, unfortunately, there is um, an alliance of, of causes. Um, there's the wokeness trend and there's uh, intersectionality. Uh, in which Black Lives Matter um, as a whole, uh, one can have their take on whether Black lives do matter. And I certainly believe that Black lives do matter. But the organization, if we look beyond the, uh, the movement, uh, the organization itself is institutionally anti-Semitic. It has said uh, it sides with the Palestinians and it says things that are uh, clearly incorrect. And it conflates the Palestinian cause with that of Black people. Um, and when something like that happens, we aren't just up against one cause, we're up against a number of causes. And so suddenly we find ourselves having to contend with a far more complex uh, narrative or set of narratives. And unfortunately, that is too, uh, that is too much for us to deal with. I, I just see Jews Don't Count by David Baddiel. Yes, highly recommended. Um, so thank you for that comment there, Marvin. Um, but yes, it's 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 far too complex to for me to answer on the spot here. So um, read that book. I would suggest as well. Fair enough. Yes, I could very very much recommend that book. Uh, good shout, Marvin Lewis. Thank you. And um, just one final question for you, Emmanuel, because we we've, we've reached half past eight. Um, if the major news organisations back their correspondence fully in reporting events in Gaza. What could Hamas do to these people if they were if they were trying to, you know, properly properly represent the facts? Um, I guess being in Gaza, they are they are at the they are at the mercy of of Hamas. I mean, let, let's you know, ultimately Hamas are an internationally prescribed terrorist organization who don't work to the same um, the same rules that. Uh, that state players do and that um, 
non-civilians do, non-Gazan civilians? I will, okay, so it's, a, it's a good question. I will take you back to 2007, when a BBC journalist by the name um, of Alan Johnston was kidnapped in Gaza by a militant group named the Army of Islam. Um, and he was kept there, he was, he was kidnapped on the 12th of March, and he was released nearly four months later on the 4th of July. So yesterday was his in personal independence day. Um, now, if you look into it, much pressure was put on the group by um, Hamas. That's what, that's what is being said. Um, the fact is that anything that happens inside of um, the Gaza Strip you know, doesn't happen without Hamas knowing about it. And so, you know, they'll say that um, Hamas put pressure on this hitherto unknown group, the Army of Islam. Um, but it's very convenient for Hamas that there are other organizations. Um, so you have Islamic Jihad, you have other splinter groups of Daesh, of ISIS, um, op that operate here and there, very small splinter cells within um, Gaza, and they can effectively do the bidding of Hamas, that Hamas can by itself plausible de deniability. And that's only what I believe happened in the case of Alan Johnston. He was kidnapped, and it was convenient for Hamas to have another group which you could um, say, oh, they're extremists, but we're the, more, we're the moderates. Um, the, the fact that just um, within this last month, Hamas expelled um, somebody who didn't toe the line tells me that, unfortunately, that, that's the status quo, that journalists just, just can't tell the full story. Um, uh, and we can't be too optimistic, unfortunately. Sure. Well, Emmanuel, it's it's been fascinating. It's um it's certainly been uh, an eye opener for many of us. Thank you very much on behalf of us, the ZF and the World Zionist Organization. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we look forward to working with you again in the future. Keep up the fantastic work. Um, honest reporting. You know, we we are we're we're all aware of what honest reporting do. You are still a relatively small organization. You punch far above your weight. So. So keep up the good work. Thank you everyone for joining us um, and be well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.